Today, the Home Secretary says her small boats plan is good for Britain. Do police need to take indecent exposure more seriously? And are cancer waiting times putting lives at risk? This is Politics Live. Joining me today, Conservative MP Tom Hunt, Labour Shadow Minister for Children and Early Years Helen Hayes, author and campaigner Dr Shola Mushog Bamimu, and non-affiliated peer Baroness Fox. So what's going on today? The Home Secretary is unveiling new legislation to tackle small boats, which, if passed, will stop asylum claims from today. Sarah Everard's murderer, Wayne Cousins, could have been stopped if he'd been arrested sooner for indecent exposure. But are crimes like this just not being taken seriously? It's been laughed about or joked about. It's not been seen for the serious sexual offending that it is. And targets to get cancer waiting times down have been missed. The big focus has been on recovering that backlog beyond 62 days by March 23 to pre-pandemic levels. So is enough being done to clear the backlog? Let's start with this story on the front page of The Independent. Um, it was reported yesterday that the former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is reportedly putting up his own father, Stanley Johnson, for a knighthood in his resignation honours list. Uh, the story today is, should Rishi Sunak, uh, the Prime Minister, block this knighthood? Tom? Well, I think the key word there is reportedly. I've yet to... There hasn't been any confirmation. Well, let's just take it at face value. Been... We've had three papers reporting it. Uh, look, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it, you know, Stanley Johnson is a public figure who I think has done some commendable work on, on the on environmental issues. I, I guess the question is, you know, if I was a prime minister or an outgoing prime minister, would I nominate my dad, um, you know, for an honour? I wouldn't. Um, but, you know, ultimately, at the moment, this is, uh, this is a report in, in the media. I'm sure all correct procedure will be followed. Um, but that's my snap of you on it. No, you wouldn't put out your father, but do you think Rishi Sunak should block it if it does uh, turn out to be I'm, the case? I mean, this is, a, this is a story in the newspaper at the moment. I think there is a precedent of outgoing prime ministers, there is. Um, you know, having a, having a, having an honours list. Um, oh. I, I think there's, you know, all procedural needs to be followed, um, but that's, that's why I want to say on the matter. Uh, Helen, um, should Rishi Sunak uh, block it if it turns out it, it is the case, which it does look like it is? Uh, Tom is right, there is a precedent, um, there's obviously a precedent for honours lists, resignation honours lists, and it is the Prime Minister or former Prime Minister's prerogative. Well, I think the Prime Minister should block this, and I think it's a key test for Rishi Sunak as to whether he is prepared to stand up to his predecessor. This is nothing more than we've come to expect from a Prime Minister who's done nothing but put his own interests first throughout the whole of his political career. And it's no surprise at all that he has a resignation honours list which is reported to be longer than anybody else's and packed full of his friends and cronies. And, of course, Rishi Sunak should stand up to this decision. It, it further undermines the trust that the public have in our politics. Should Rishi Sunak block it? Absolutely, yes. The king should step in if he's got the backbone to do the same. The reality here is this is nepotism in a nutshell. Although, we, as we know, there are resignation honours mm. lists for all sorts of people that have worked for former Prime Minister Sholi. Uh, there have always been accusations we, of uh, yeah. nepotism. But we also know that this is Boris Johnson. We're talking about... Um, we're talking about a politician who left office in disgrace because of corruption that took place on his watch. We know for a fact that Boris Johnson is universally accepted to be a liar, to be incompetent, to be Absolutely. untrustworthy, to be dishonest. The universal so, yeah. bit universal. might yeah, not the, quite be the case. But Pretty the sure reality, find a few the reality let me finish my point, please. The reality here is Boris Johnson putting his father up for honours when it is clear to anybody to question the integrity of this appointment and to ask, what the heck did your father do except be your father, to be on the honestness, for what reason? So, yeah, it should be blocked. Claire? I think if you ask the king, he might rather like Stanley Johnson because they'd be able to wax lyrical on the environment and green issues. That's why I, 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 as far as I'm concerned, the honours list has been 
deeply discredited over many years for this kind of thing. I don't think this is any... It, it, it obviously appears more egregious. I also am aware, and I want to just say now, the same has been true about peerage lists, right? And I was the beneficiary of one of those. Mm. And you can just have rows all the time. You know, should Labour have appointed Tom Watson to the House of Lords? Should Boris Johnson oh, have deputy. given peerages to myself, Gisela Stewart and Kate Hoey as obviously kind of red wall type Brexiteers? There'll always be rows about these things. And I do think it's worth saying that it's a shame that these honours are discredited by this notion of cronyism and so on and so forth. So I wouldn't mind a, a shake-up of the whole honour system. Mm. I, I don't uh, particularly think that there is, you know, Boris Johnson is the worst culprit forever. I just think that they've been doing it forever. And cronyism is something which is undermining trust in both the honours system and in the political system. So oh, it's a shame. There's just no integrity at all. And so the public can't trust why certain people are being selected for honours. Well, should they just get rid of it altogether, Helen? Oh. I think it's important that, that we have a system that rewards... Right. Excellence and right, public but service. Think, but you don't think it should um, be got rid of altogether. Well, I think it's important we recognise it wasn't that long ago uh, that we had a um, you know a senior figure was appointed to do an inquiry into anti-Semitism within the Labour Party, uh, which seemed to find there was no problem, and that person was made a, a, a baroness. Shami, Shami uh, only a short while after. Really? So and the I think I think I, so, so well, I, I, I think that the idea that this is a uniquely a, a conservative problem is inaccurate. I think saying things like, you know, Boris Johnson is universally viewed as this or universally viewed as that, oh, it's clearly an incorrect statement. Because, no, it's not. Uh, well, it, it is, because all I need to do to prove you wrong is find one person who disagrees with you. No, 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 no. Which, I, which I'm, I'm, I'm pretty honestly, sure I could do in about Because there will be people seconds. who disagree. But there so is no doubt that then. Boris Johnson has lied, he's misled, he's untrustworthy. Look, I can go through the whole list if you, you want. But we haven't got time to do it on this. <laughs> we haven't got time. I'm going to leave it here because it's clearly controversial. Uh, but we have touched um, on this issue in terms of the resignation honours list, specifically in the case of Boris Johnson when it becomes public. Let's talk about uh, the small boat crossings because the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, is expected to be on her feet in the House of Commons in just under 10 minutes' time, expected to deliver a statement um, talking about the details the government wants to pass through. Uh, they're going to introduce a bill which won't become law for several months or so. It will re apply retrospectively, meaning anyone arriving in the UK, as the government sees it, illegally on small boats, will be at risk of deportation immediately uh, under the laws. Let's just show you the front pages. The Daily Express. Suella, back law to stop boats or betray Britain. Uh, and this is the front page of The Sun. Uh, this is talking about the no-entry small boat migrants banned from today. Of course, the bill is not yet law. Why is it a betrayal to Britain to go against the plans, Tom? Well, look, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear to say I think the vast majority of people in this country, and certainly in my constituency, want to see this bill be a success. They want us to have control of our borders. They don't think it's right that people turn up here illegally from another safe European country, France, and then are able to stay here. So, look, I mean, I, I think it's... Um, I think it's. I think we need to get behind this bill. I think it's. But I th why is it a betrayal to Britain if you oppose it? Well, I, look. I mean, that's not a word I used. But ultimately, I think that this bill mm. is vitally important. It's successful. Um, I think that you know we should be compassionate towards um, refugees coming here, fleeing directly from persecution. There's clearly a limit to the number we can take because um, of pressure on public services, etc. But we're only going to be able to do that if we clamp down on the illegal immigration. And we've seen f over 40,000 people make that unsafe journey over the last year alone. We've got to do something, and we've got to push something forward with teeth. And only by sending a strong message, like this bill sends, can we, in my view, grapple with the issue truly. Helen, it, there is political consensus, isn't there, in terms of stopping the boats? Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, says that he is committed to stopping those boats crossing the Channel. Well, crossing the channel in a small boat is a desperately perilous mm. journey to make mm. and nobody wants to see vulnerable people putting their lives at risk in that way. So there's but agreement the, there between the, the parties in but, terms of stopping the boats? Look, the government is talking, Suella Braverman this morning, is talking about 45,000 people who've come uh, across that route over the, the last year, mm. talking about the £7 million a day the government is spending on hotel accommodation, mm. as if this is no nothing to do with her. Whereas this is the, um, this is the impact <clears throat> of 13 years uh, of the Conservative I... government running a dysfunctional 
immigration and asylum system in our country. The, the proposals that are being announced mm. today are a rehash of the proposals in the Borders Bill last year. <clears throat> that hasn't worked. It, it, that's made the problem worse than, than, than it was. And this is just not the approach that we so, need. You know, it's become clear from what I've... The answers, the questions haven't been directly answered, but it's become quite clear to me that the Labour Party doesn't support the principle that if you arrive here illegally, you shouldn't be able to claim asylum. So the Labour Party seems to disagree with that broad principle. And also, let's, let's be clear, you know, Sir Keir Starmer, when he was a human rights lawyer, said that raci racism, undertones of racism, permeate, permeates all, all immigration controls. That's what he well, said when he was a human rights the Labour Party. So ultimately, we've got a Labour Party who repeatedly voted against measures to control our borders, repeatedly voted against the Rwanda scheme, voted against the Borders Bill. You know, the Labour Party, other than vague platitudes, you've got nothing to say on this. That's but absolutely not true. The, the Labour Party wants to see a system which enables the UK to play our part in welcoming vulnerable people fleeing for their lives to this country, but does so in a way that is efficient and effective. The route to solving mean? the desperate problem mm. of people risking their lives in the channel is to have a functioning asylum system that actually processes that some claims and makes mean? some decisions um, that allows Actually. The opening of safe and legal routes. Right, we'll come um, on to safe and legal routes in just a moment. There are Should two things I just... Well, hang on, count? well, I'll come on to all these questions in just a moment. But first of all, um, all those things you said wouldn't be a deterrent, necessarily. You're talking about processing claims yeah. um, here, rightly or wrongly. Uh, but and I just cracking to... down on, on the illegal smugglers. I mean, that, this, but this... I just want to put some... I mean, if passed, um, just to be clear to our viewers, it would be the end of this country accepting asylum claims from anyone arriving on our shores by boat to, to claim asylum here. That's right, isn't it? Absolutely. Right. So that would be the end of that system. Will you back the bill? I can't see that we will be backing a bill which the government has been boasting this morning mm. pushes at the limits of international law. Why would we be demeaning the standing, so the standing you, of the do? UK in, on the international stage in that way by pushing at the limits of international law? The Labour Party believes in a rules-based system for international law so that we can hold tyrants like Putin to account under it. We don't want to be undermining and supporting legislation that undermines the rule of international law. This is about a deterrent, Shola. Everyone wants to stop people People getting in those boats and making that perilous journey. Um, and successive governments, conservative governments, have failed to do it and they've made it an absolute pledge to do so. Do you think this will work? You may not like it, but do you think it will work? No, it will not. Absolutely not. And I'll tell you why. All the Conservative Party is doing is single-handedly creating an enhanced um, business model for people traffickers. What they are doing is criminalizing the very people that we should be supporting. They are criminalizing women, men, and children who have no Maybe. safe and legal routes. Let me finish. Who have no safe and legal routes to get here. And by safe and legal routes, I'm pretty much talking about either granting them the opportunity to have a visa to come for the journey, or perhaps to be able to travel without a visa but with permission so that they can be processed. The Home Office policy itself says that you cannot apply for asylum unless you are in this country. We are deliberately, by virtue of this government, we are deliberately dehumanising and demonising people who need support. Hey. It's not going to work. People traffickers, uh, according to um, uh -huh. an interview that happened with a people trafficker on mm. Sky News, they said we're already here. Yeah. So all, all we are doing through this government is to create a new business model that will increase the significant risk to lives all right. and the exploitation all right. Let of me get clear. Lives. Let me get clear. I mean, could it act as a deterrent? I mean, initially not, um, but could it act as a deterrent if people think they cannot claim asylum here? I think there is a possibility that it could act as a deterrent because of one, one fact at the moment is that most people know that once they arrive in the UK, they've got a very good chance that they will stay in the UK. The processing is taking too long. I think Helen is right on that. Oh, and so at the, no, at the moment, what you've got is that you, there is an incentive to come here because you would risk your life um, not necessarily fleeing uh, war and persecution. We know even just to get a better life, right? And I'm not condemning people wanting a better life, but on the other hand, to pretend that everybody in those boats is fleeing war and persecution is just uh, is just a, a myth, and and is a kind of attempt to gaslight you by saying if you say that that somehow you don't care about people fleeing war. But what I what I was going to say was that I, I think that 
the legal challenges threat that Helen has mm. made and which others are making is very unhelpful because actually what happens is international law is used to say to the people of the UK, everybody, you can't control your borders. That's what is being used. And I, I think that all of those... Laws. We all, we, those international we, all of those... Just hold on. The point is, <laughs> international law is not as important as the UK making its own laws and controlling its but own borders. But the UK kept to write the, those international laws. They did. Laws. Well, let Helen respond That's to that, and I'll come that. back it to is. a point. <laughs> Helen, but what about that? What about international law? Was it written... Uh, were the laws that the UK helped shape and, and sign up to there in terms of dealing with this particular issue? Well, what the UK government is doing is bearing down on vulnerable people taking to small boats, not the operators of the small boats. And that is where there is a very strong role for UK law to break the business model of those who are profiting from people's but vulnerability. So but say, for example, I mean, I, I, I don't imagine that one would have one law where you don't try and absolutely target the people smugglers. I get that. That's fine. That's not what's being no, announced no, today. Just hold on. Correct. Just hold on. The problem I've got is that every time there's a debate on this, mm. whenever it comes up in the Lords or whenever I'm on TV, the yes but argument is used, which means you never do anything. So I understand the sympathy which a lot of members of the public will have for this bill because they're well, desperate. But, you know, you saw that but, village in Leicestershire but, last night yes, where 250 people... Like, no, 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 but we, we, a village of 4,000 people, 250 people going in the only hotel that's right. used for communities mm. swimming and so on. Oh, well, there people are some are tearing their hands. There are some practical examples. Hang on, Shola, I'm going to come to you because... No. I want you to respond to something Shola said, which is that actually, Conservative government, this one and others, uh, you're demonising people rather than um, deterring so, so, people. So, so, so obviously, you know, we're dealing with a situation here where we've got, you know, it's mainly men. Um, a, lot, a lot come from countries like Albania, which is a safe country. A lot, but and not Afghanistan. Some, some, some and Afghanistan. And, and the, impor you. the important thing is, we're dealing with people who have co gone through a number of safe European countries where they've refused to claim asylum. <laughs> Um, a, a lot of them are economic migrants. The fact of the matter is, of the Labour Party, is so. there is no evidence they support any kind of immigration control. You does Helen want to cap on the number of refugees? Well, of course let, she doesn't. Okay, let, let me, let me tell you. Well, let, I'm, going to let Shola, I'm going to let Shola come yeah. in because if you all talk over yeah. each other, viewers I'm can't hear. But Shola, specifically on the safe yeah. routes. Yeah. It's easy to do. Let me come, to, yeah. let me come yeah. to the safe routes, yeah. um, Shola, because there aren't many safe routes. Um, there are routes uh, for Ukrainian refugees. Um, there is There is a route, yep, for people from Hong Kong. There has been for Syria and has been for Afghanistan. Would you like to see, if you you look at the list of people claiming asylum who arrive here by small boat. Yes, there are a significant number uh, coming from Albania, but then there is Afghanistan, Syria, Syria Eritrea, yeah. Iran. Correct. Would you like safe routes from all of those countries and more? I want safe legal routes that would ensure Should that people capped? don't have to take desperate measures because the safe okay. legal route is capped? not... Let me finish. The yeah, safe legal finish. route does not equate to an automatic admission into the country because that still needs to go through its process, but it, may, it means that they don't have to take desperate measures to get here. And when you talk, using the same divisive rhetoric, mostly men come from Albania, they Most don't stop being fat. Exactly all thing. of that, all of that is actually the gaslighting fact. that Claire is referring fact. to because all you're doing is... Data. Trying to feed I've the politically the illiterate in this look, country, looked, and you're making which is them most feel people. Oh, no, not, which is not on. most it's people. Not, most it? people see through that divisive nonsense. No, they, they can't. And they call you out for oh, it. All right, all right. Hang no, on, um, Claire. Briefly, and I must just. Come I back don't to think Helen. it can be divisive to note the facts. It is factually the case that most of them are young men. I don't necessarily think that's a problem, but it's fact. It's, it's fact that women they could still and, be vulnerable. and children they, they dying could, and they're men vulnerable. could still be vulnerable. But making the them look is, like they're economic okay. migrants as though they just... Some of them are. Some, some of them are, but not all. First of all, no, there's, there's nothing wrong with economic migrants for a start off. You're actually demonising them. I'm not. I'm, I'm saying suggesting. that you're making them I'm look like economic migrants. I'm suggesting that to simply present everybody in those boats as the vulnerable that this country has to take, because if you don't, you're cruel, you don't care about people, is actually a way that you are demonising ordinary no, working people No, it is the other way around. For the concerns it is that not, have that is not the case, because it is the so, other way around. I think, I think, I think, people finish, finish I think it is perfectly to. reasonable to not say it's divisive, to note the things that we just noted. Yeah. I think it's important, because uh, I thought it was a good question, Maybe what we need to do is to say that there are other places that you can get legal 
application for refugees but from. With, with all due respect, France already takes way more than we do. And the fact that oh. someone does not stop in France or any other country does not mean that one country is a safe uh, space for them, particularly if they have connections to this country. They may have connections yeah, safe in through our colonization of their yeah, country, through language, through culture, through having connections <coughs> in this country. All right. That is the point. All right. Well, let me Albania. Using, when sorry, do we colonize well, you Albania? You usually <laughs> use language. Again, you're targeting Albanians for no but good you said reason. All right, well, hang on. Hang on. Albanians. They're part Syrians, so, uh, Afghanistan. The majority are Albanians. Albanians. Should, we Should we cap the numbers? Should we cap the numbers? The point is this. Yeah. People having to take desperate measures to come here and because they need from refuge. France. Let, all right, so, so, let me so France. create safe let, and legal yeah. routes for them to get here. Stop talking and would about you cap it. Should we cap the numbers? Tom, I'm going to come to you and we do. Tom. I'm going to come to you in just a second. Should the numbers be capped? That is the other suggestion in the proposals, that Parliament should be able to set an annual cap for the number of refugees, people claiming asylum here. Well, when, you when we have a crisis, an entirely unpredicted mm -hmm. crisis mm -hmm. like Ukraine mm -hmm. or like Afghanistan or like Syria, that the demand of the British public is that the UK responds to those crises and welcomes people to this country. That, that there is no way within a cap of dealing with those crises. The route to solving this challenge is international cooperation. We had the former well, Conservative Prime Minister who couldn't decide whether France was our friend or our of, foe. But Rishi Sunak's um, going there on Friday we, to meet we, President it, Macron. It is international cooperation. Um, it is cracking down on the exploitative smugglers and it is but providing safe and legal routes that, that work okay. functionally for, for where the so, need is greatest. I know. So, but, um, but, but, got... There's a couple of key points yes. here. Firstly, the Labour, the Labour Party is opposed to a cap on the number of refugees. Secondly, they think that if you arrive here illegally um, from another safe European country, you should be able to climb asylum. And thirdly, they cannot... They cannot explain why these people haven't claimed asylum in France, which is a safe country. They're not fleeing well, persecution. They're fleeing France. 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 That is no. not I'm not opening this up. And if I, that they're is not illegal. Yes, they are. They are, they are, they are illegal. Guys, international I can, law, shall I tell you, illegals. the viewers, we get more complaints. We get more complaints because people... Every single one of them. Shola, people complain because they can't hear Tom. People complain because they can't hear when everyone shouts over each other. So we lose your salient points from all of the panellists. Just finally, is it the wrong way round to introduce this bill before new safe legal routes are opened, which the government is suggesting it is in favour of? I, I actually don't think the public will accept um, the kind of, you know, accept that until we nip this problem in the bud. I think once we sort out the issue of illegal immigration, I think the public can actually, we can win the confidence of the public into, into the system. I would like us to be compassionate, but it needs to be controlled. There needs oh. to be a process. For All right, we're going, to, no, we're going to stop it there and we're going to move on because yesterday uh, you will have heard that the former police officer, Wayne Cousins, was sentenced to 19 months for three counts of indecent exposure. He is already serving a life sentence for the murder of Sarah Everard and victims of the indecent exposure believe that could have been stopped if the police had responded sooner. Um, the uh, Deputy Assistant Commissioner Stuart Cundy of the Metropolitan Police was asked about whether indecent exposure is taken seriously enough as a crime by the BBC special correspondent Lucy Manning. Let's have a listen. Do you accept indecent exposure hasn't properly been investigated and still isn't? I can't speak for all of policing, but I, my own view, I think it's fair to say that um, we could have done more and we do need to do more and we will do more. If you are a victim of somebody who's um, exposed themselves to you, I would urge you to contact us. We've also got, you know, Crime Stoppers and other lines, but the more people that tell us about these offences, the more we can identify the links and identify and bring to justice those that are responsible. Claire, has it not been taken seriously enough by the police because there will be many people who say it seems to be a gateway for more serious sexual offences? I think that um, uh, flashing, as it used to be mm. known, um, we've got ourselves into a right mess over this. I mean, I, I, I heard, you know, of this parish, as it were, Justin Webb commenting on the fact that on Channel 4 you had... Jordan Gray, a comedian, playing penis piano, would you believe, and everybody laughing about it. Mm -hmm. There's a whole saga that's taken place about, uh, you know, men and their genitals in women's changing rooms. And I mention that because I think that what's happened is, is that if you've tried to raise these issues around exposure as being sexual, it hasn't been taken a mess. And the police, of all people, are in a mess over it. 
it doesn't mean that I think that every low level, you know, the danger of relativizing mm. these things is where people then start saying, yes, catcalling leads to rape. I don't think that's true. I think that, however, sexual mm. offences such as exposure do need to be taken seriously. Just the other thing is, I think the police have got in a mess about what they call low level, as we've even seen from this event in Cardiff, this tragic story mm. of the the young people in the car, where they kind of, they didn't use their instincts. As somebody said, it was tick box policing in an interview, a former police officer said, you know, rather than thinking this could be serious, we should do something, they're actually not taking up what they consider to be low level crimes in general. So I think we've got a double crisis here, not taking men exposing themselves seriously because culturally we've lost the plot on that one. And secondly, the police themselves <laughs> not being very efficient in dealing with all crimes as they present themselves. How do you, how seriously should it be taken? Indecent exposure, let's stick with this particular um, crime, because Claire mentions a spectrum of things. Upskirting is another one, cat calling. Is there a spectrum or does it all need to be taken far more seriously in terms of behaviour towards women? I think Claire is right to mention the spectrum. Um, where I slightly disagree with you is where that spectrum is not understood to be a motivator for the crime against women. So misogyny, I find, in our country is not taken seriously. So mis that means that misogyny, misogyny <coughs> motivated crimes, whether it starts with indistant exposure and even catcalling. Because let me tell you this, it's not about what the man has done. It's not just about what the man has done, but how it makes women feel insecure. Now, if women had, um, as they did, reported when uh, cousins for the indecent exposure reported him, say he was catcalling, all of these things, if there was a report of it, it should have created a profile yeah. of somebody who is clearly graduating from one level of, you know, violence against women to another. And, of course, I am not surprised that, they, that the police totally messed up here. Wayne Cousins used his authority mm. as a police officer and understanding how the system of policing works to violate women. I mean, one in ten women have been subjected, um, Tom, to indecent exposure and more than 113,000 last year, one in ten women in general, and 113,000 last year, according to the Office for National Statistics, uh, and that's the Crime Survey for England and Wales. It's quite shocking, but is there a sense that actually even people generally in society don't take it seriously enough, indecent exposure? I think in many cases it isn't taken seriously enough and I, and I, and I do think there is a link between um, it not being um, taken seriously and potentially then linking in with much more serious crimes mm. and I think it seems to have been the case here. Um, you know, I, at the same time, I think that we, there's got to be a little bit of discretion looking at each case. Um, I, I wouldn't want to clamp down maybe too hard on something which is wrong, but you know, we, we, but I, I certainly think that it seems to me that they, they can be a link, and it's linked to misogyny. It's linked to, uh, and I think often flashing is a way of um, some sexist males um, being misogynistic, and it's how they express it. And I think we should combat it. I think we should take a tough line on it. Right. I think the Home Secretary's um, got an inquiry at the moment, which is looking at the relation to police and, and women and how and that, and, and, and some, looking at those issues, trying to tease out some of the problems. Right. Well, before I come to you, Helen, uh, we're just going to hear from Dame Diana Johnson, who is the Labour Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, answering questions about whether indecent exposure or flashing is taken seriously. It's been laughed about or joked about. It's not been seen for the serious sexual offending that it is to, to do this. So I think an increase in sentencing... I mean, I tried to bring amendments forward in, in various Home Office bills in the past, and the government haven't accepted those amendments, but I'm hoping perhaps in the Victims' Bill, which is coming before Parliament uh, in the future, we might be able to get this actually recognised for what it mm. is, serious is serious offending and it affects the lives of, of women and girls up and down the country. Should police be mandated to take action if they get a report on indecent exposure? Well, it is a crime and the police should investigate crime. I mean, it, and, and it is uh, it, shocking that that is not the case. Indecent exposure is a crime of violation, it is a crime of power and control and it is frightening and distressing for its victims. Those crimes should be investigated when they are reported. It was devastating yesterday to hear two of the victims, mm. Wayne Cousins, indecent exposure. One of them saying 
if this had been picked up, we could have saved Sarah Everard. And the other one talking about how this has ruined her experience of the countryside, walking and cycling in the countryside near her home. Um, it is not something that she can enjoy anymore after what he did. That's a crime of control. And, uh, of course, it should be investigated and taken seriously. And, of course, for some offenders, there is a risk that that, that crime will escalate in their behaviour to much more damaging and devastating crimes. I think the important thing to note is that not everybody who sexually exposes themselves, which is an act of sexual deviancy and a crime and should be punished as such, is a rapist. That was the point I was mm. making. And I think it's important but, because uh, I think with, with Cousins, what, what, when it said we should have picked him up because he wouldn't have gone, the point is he should have been prosecuted for that crime, mm. right? And then he might have been in prison and not been able to go on. He wouldn't have been it, a police it, officer. Not, it, and the, but the, the point about Wayne Cousins, and I think Shell is right on this, is that actually everybody knew he had form and nobody did anything because he was a police officer. But I just think well. it's important to have proportionality because this is important. No, there is a sense of proportionality. You can't say that every single sexual offence is the same, otherwise our justice system goes out of the window. It doesn't mean that I think that it should be laughed at or not taken seriously. It is a crime, there is a sentence, but I'm suggesting that the police are not prosecuting what they consider to be lower-level crimes. And I think that sense of proportionality can be achieved by building a profile of said people. So, for instance, if Claire was to um, report to the police about catcalling of a certain Which I man, wouldn't. In case, I'm just using you as an example. And then I do the same and I complain about indecent exposure from the same person, the police starts to build a profile, which then, in my mind, would make them understand, OK, there's a graduation of some kind here, an escalation. But if it's somebody who is just catcalling and they've not done anything else, again, the record is important. This is not just about what a man does. It's about how safe women feel in this country. And women right now have zero trust in the policing system. Should there be tougher sentences, too? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, mean, I, I think it needs to be, you know, there needs to be some proportionality. So I agree with that point. But yes, I do. I think it, I think it's it's undoubtedly often the case that these lower level offences, but which are still very much offences and should be punished, can be can link and can feed through into much worse offences. And I, I think it's, um, yeah. I mean, one of the problems is that the women that uh, you were talking about who were uh, interviewed, m many of them um, don't feel it's worth reporting, yes, even in decent yeah. exposure, because well, but, but, it won't be but, taken but, but seriously. Sa you know, that, sadly, that is the case with many other forms of crime as well. Well, um, um, you know, yeah. and, and you know, whether the shopkeepers get their windows smashed, etc. Sometimes they don't report a crime, so there's, there's a bigger issue there. But look, I think there's this case about um, women in the police and their experiences of dealing with the police. There is an inquiry ongoing there. I don't want to brand this. I, I, I'm always. When I talk about the police, I always like to stick to it. what I know is true, which is that the vast majority of men and women who go into our police forces are dedicated public servants with the right values. Uh, and I would not want to sort of smear the entire you know, police as being somehow sexist or racist. Yeah. I mean, it's wrong. I mean, I I've, never I've never liked that term institutionally racist. When it okay. Comes to okay, I don't doubt that they're good police. I have no doubt in my mind that they're good police. But to be blind to the fact that the policing system in our country is institutionally racist and institutionally misogynist is quite frankly delusional. I think that even with good police, good police are blindsided. They've got walls built up because mm -hmm. when one of them does something wrong, the whole system, you know, stands up to protect the reputation of the police rather than to serve and protect as they should. So I have zero problem saying that the police is institutionally racist and institutionally misogynist. And besides, there have been cases where they've been found to be such. All right, we're going to talk about NHS cancer waiting times. They've hit record highs across the UK uh, last year. Uh, NHS England had a target of March this year to return cancer waiting times to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, when asked if this target would be hit, this is what Dame Callie Palmer, you heard her in the headlines too, NHS England National Cancer Director, had to say. We're discussing currently with the Secretary of State the target for March 24, and that's both in terms of the reduction in the backlog. Um, this, is a, this is a move, this is a dynamic target because we want those volumes to keep coming forward. So the target for March 24 is under discussion. Dynamic target. It's been missed for this year. Mm. Why? I, mean, I think I think we've, we've got to look at the issue that we've had with the pandemic and the pressure that's placed on the NHS. I think not to do that is to is to not be straight with the public. All right, although... But that, but that, but that isn't to say that this right. is OK. No, because I mean, it, predate, clearly, it predates you know, it. It's, you, know, it's, you, know, a lot, you know, a lot of this has been incredibly exacerbated by the pandemic. 
Um, it is right that as one of the Prime Minister's five priorities, he has got cutting NHS waiting lists, and of course includes cancer waiting lists. Um, we've got 19 new community diagnostic centres being rolled out. Um, you know, the Prime Minister sees it as a huge priority. Uh, but, you know, clearly I've got nothing but immense sympathy. And it's not right that people are having to wait that length of time. Of course it's not. Um, but, I, I, you know, I, I, think, I think there is some sign of progress in terms of some of the longest waiting, waiting lists being cut. I think that's going to continue, uh, and, and I think we can, we can get on top of this. Uh, just to give an idea uh, to viewers, in England, 59... Well, so nearly 60% of patients started treatment within the 62-day target in July 2022. That's a record low. It's worse in Wales, where there is a Labour government. Helen, why, why, why would it be worse there? Well, I, I can't speak for the Welsh government mm. um, and health is a devolved matter. What I can say is that in England, cancer waiting times have been getting worse mm. every single year since 2010. So undoubtedly the pandemic placed intense pressure on an, our, our NHS. Mm. But this is a problem that predates um, the pandemic. And it is a problem about lack of workforce planning in the NHS. Mm -hmm. And it is a problem about lack of capacity in the NHS in England. And how would you clear the backlogs now? Well, we have a very clear pledge to double the number of medical school places, to um, increase the number of nurses who are graduating every year, to increase the number of allied health professionals who are graduating any, uh, every year, and to properly plan with the NHS for the workforce that they need. I mean, the problem, Helen's right. I mean, it, it does predate the pandemic. Yes, of course, you can't ignore the impact of the pandemic. But, Tom, uh, we haven't met the target of 85% of people receiving their first treatment within 62 days since 2015. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't doubt there aren't issues to do with the workforce that need to be, need well. to, need to be looked at. But, no, it, but, it, but it is an important point that you, you make about Wales. It is a very important point. You know, well, the fact that it, because it's well. a well, 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 no, but it's it's true though because the, the Welsh the Welsh um, um, government have got exactly the same challenges. So dealing with an NHS which has been affected in the same way by a pandemic, and actually their figures are worse. So I guess Scotland's are better. Uh, I, I I I I mean I'm from Wales and I can just tell you now that the Welsh NHS is a disgrace to behold, and I'm not making a well, party political point. I'm, no, they're I'm not here to. to yeah. No. But well, you just pointed that I out. Did, I did, I did. And there's so many in special measures. And you talk to anyone who works in the health service and they're sure. tearing their hair out. But how, but anyway, how would you this, clear the backlog? Yes, on this. I think there's no sense of urgency on this. Mm. So I don't, ah. think, I don't think that... Um, you, when we say it's the pandemic, I mean, first of all, it wasn't the pandemic, it was the mm. political reaction to the pandemic, which has been much discussed recently, which is the NHS was turned into a COVID-only service. Everybody who worked in oncology mm -hmm. and lots of cancer patients, mm -hmm. two of my good friends, by the way, one in particular, their oncologist said that she died, Helena Goldberg, as a consequence of not getting the treatment mm -hmm. because of the lockdowns, when they were about to treat her and they were not allowed to. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that the wards were being used by COVID patients, it was that everything mm -hmm. stopped. So that's one problem. Mm -hmm. But how are we going to solve it? I think that there has to be a much greater sense of urgency. I agree with all of the Labour Party plans, by the way, on workforce planning. I'm all with that. But I think that that's too slow. I think that if you're going to set Nightingale hospitals up. I mean, what you've got to do is to have a seven-day uh, um, uh, 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 NHS. I think that consultants should be working over weekends. I don't mean the same no, consultants no. should be working. But again, that would week. be staff shortages no, know, wouldn't know, help. But what I'm saying is you've mm. got to kind of do things like that. Yeah. And the other thing is, is that cancer, as it happens, you need to get in there on stage one and stage two. GP surgeries are still not back to normal. And GP surgeries are never open when normal people who've got jobs can go to them. So what you've got to have is, I think that this is something, it's not just cancer, it's also heart uh, mm, conditions. Right. Where we, we actually say, we had a crisis around COVID, it wasn't good before, but now let's have a national strategy mm. that focuses in on this, that everything goes into sure. intervening to ensure that we save lives, because oh. I just feel it's too sluggish and slow. Shola? I agree with Claire. Well, there we go. Good. <laughs> no, because Some consensus I, I, at last. How lovely. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I know I am sick and tired of being sick and tired of hearing <laughs> that COVID is the reason why the NHS is, you know, failing right now. And what about the point that actually lockdowns yeah. uh, might I, have contributed to people being scared that. despite Chris Whitty saying, come yeah. to hospital? But to Claire's <coughs> point about the political reaction and that political reaction mm. feeding the lack of necessary medical support 
to, you know, to the public in dealing with the ongoing crisis with cancer patients, with waiting lists and everything else. That, I think, really fed uh, I, to a large part of it. I, I think, so, can I just pick up on two points uh, made by Claire, actually? I think the first of them was, was, was the response to a pandemic. And I, I really do hope that... Um, and um, these Matt Hancock leaks. Um, um, I think if one thing can come from that, it's a balanced inquiry that actually isn't all about oh, could we have locked down sooner or later, but actually looks at some of these, some of these consequences of locking down. One of those is education, mm -hmm. and another one is, is is oncology as well. And the second point, which I which I also um, I, 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 I was a sensible point, was about GPs and primary care. You know, the proportion of um, NHS funding that goes into primary care, you know isn't what it was perhaps and I think we need to put more into primary care I think if we put more into primary care made it easier to see a GP and, got, and actually got them doing more I think actually we could we could we could um, solve a lot of problems downstream. Can I just make a tiny point? Tiny. Carl Sikora, the oncologist who you know, mm. has worked in the private yes, system, made a big fuss about this during lockdown, and he was called a COVID denier and demonised. And the reason I'm saying that is, is even now he's saying, well, there's the Rutherford clinics that we've got that are private. Why don't the government take them on? And nobody's doing anything. That's what I mean. It's, there are ways that you could solve this. Actually, yeah. all right, very briefly. Uh, I mean, I, I just <coughs> on Claire's point about urgency that there is urgency in the NHS. I mean, I speak to doctors and oh, NHS leaders that. in my constituency right. who are obsessed with getting cancer diagnoses, but there is a shortage of radiologists, there is a shortage of chemotherapy nurses, there is a shortage of cancer workforce oh, yes. that There's has come from 10 years NHS, of, of, of neglect on this issue. All right, well, I said that we might be able to hear from Suella Bravham, and she has been speaking in the Commons. Let's take a listen. The British people are famously a fair and patient people. But their sense of fair play has been tested beyond its limits, and they've seen the country taken for a ride. Their patience has run out. The law-abiding patriotic majority have said, enough is enough. This cannot and will not continue. Their government, this government, must act decisively, must act with determination, must act with compassion, must act with proportion. So make no mistake, this Conservative government, this Conservative Prime Minister will act now to stop the boats. So Ella Bravham and there, let's talk to Nick Erdley, the BBC's chief political correspondent who was listening, uh, has been to that statement. Um, what else did she have to say, Nick? Hi, Joe. Well, the crux of the message from the Home Secretary was quite a simple one, actually, that people won't stop coming, she says, until they real unless they realise that you'll be detained and swiftly removed. So a lot of what has just been confirmed has been trailed over the, the last few days that anybody coming via a small boat will be detained. They won't be allowed bail or to launch a judicial review for the first 28 days and the government will be able to detain them until they are removed. There'll be a legal duty for the Home Secretary to remove people um, and we're told it will radically narrow the number of challenges and appeals that can be launched in the UK. People can appeal once they're sent to a, a third country, but, but not while they're still in the country. Parliament will set a quota for the number of refugees that the UK is prepared to take in under these plans. And interestingly, Suella Braverman said, look, I can't be sure, or I can't give you a definite statement at the moment mm. that this does comply with ah. the European Convention on human rights. Right, so she obviously is anticipating that there will be, could be, legal challenges. This, of course, is a key priority for Rishi Sunak, but we've been waiting some time for this. Is that because of the potential legal challenges? Yeah, and look, there's a, there was another thing that caught my eye from Suella Braverman where she said that the final, finest legal minds in the country continue to work on this legislation. Sounds to me like it's not a finished product yet. Nick Erdley, thank you very much there. And thank you to all of my guests for joining me today on Politics Live. I'll be back tomorrow for Prime Minister's Questions at 12, but we'll be on air at 11.15 on BBC Two and the BBC iPlayer. Bye-bye. <laughs>